Welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show that talks about all things essence. I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird, and as usual, we want to talk about the things, the stories, the storytelling around the campfire that uh, we share our experiences with one another because that's how we learn and grow. And we're going to be talking about a lot of things around women and body image and coming into self-love and how can you love your body, how can you love the body you're in through all the domestication that we've received through our culture. So that's kind of the subject that we're going to be talking about today. So I hope this resonates for you. And I want to welcome our guest, Nina Mandelson. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a delight to be here, Carrie. Yeah. Any way that we can help people find that soul nectar, right? Absolutely. (laughs) And especially around bodies because our culture doesn't support us in feeling that soul connection with ourselves. It creates a lot of barriers for women to have that real deep relationship with our body. Yeah. And you're the perfect person to tell us about this because you are almost a relationship counselor for women and their bodies. That's what you do. That is what I do. (laughs) So Nina helps women get along with their body. More than that, she helps women move into a caring, loving, enriching, nourishing relationship with their body. With over 25 years of experience, Nina, a board-certified health coach, psychology of eating coach, and body trust provider. The heart of what she does is that she helps women learn how to deeply listen to their own bodies and with that conversation, how to create a real alliance with their body. Nina is the founder of the Nourished Woman Nation, and her website is ninamandelson.com. And you'll be able to find that in your email. So, okay, let's get down to business. You know, I know that you do this work because of your personal journey, because I just know how, how it is, right? We get into the work that we do because of what we experience. So tell us about your journey. So let's see this, the, the one liner is I never felt at home in my body. I didn't feel good. I didn't feel comfortable. I was at war. I was struggling. And I started dieting when I was about 12. And I didn't stop dieting for decades, right? Because that's the way I was taught to take care of my body. Oh, if you want to take care of your body and you want to feel good in your body, then you should be on a diet. And you're not, you know, the cultural ideal of beauty, then you should be on a diet. And so the struggle was very deep. I was ingrained in being at war, in questioning everything I ate. Did I eat too much? Did I eat not enough? Did I um, eat the wrong thing? Did I eat too much, you know, carbs, sugars, whatever? Did I, you know, am, is the weight on the number on the scale going up, right? There was constant conversation of, diet management in my head and there was never that sense that I believe that we all deserve to feel that sense of I trust my body I feel at home in my body I feel good in my body because our culture sells us body dissatisfaction ah that is such a powerful statement our culture sells us body dissatisfaction, right. you know, and, and our culture does it through who? Our mothers. We get right. it from our moms. Yeah, we do. My first diet was with my mom, right? Oh, you don't like the way you look? Let's go on a diet together, right? From a totally well-intentioned, let me take care of you in the way that I learned how to take care of my body, which is the culture said, oh, you're not feeling good in your body. Let's, we've got a plan for you. We've got a product for you. We've got a diet for you, right? And so we start to learn how to be in that relationship with our body from a management perspective, right? So first we learn how to be dissatisfied, right? That it's not good enough, that the people in the magazines and on TV that they, that we should look like they look like the models. And then if we don't look, so first we're sold the body dissatisfaction and then we're sold, 
then this is now how you should manage your body. This is how you should take care of your body. But all that leaves us is in a constant loop of body hatred, body management, body hatred, body management. Or sometimes it goes body management, I'm feeling good. This gets into a different circle. This is the diet cycle. I'm feeling, I'm, I wanna go, I wanna feel better. And so I go on a diet. It works really great for uh, three weeks, four weeks. You know, if I'm really rocking it, six weeks, I'm feeling great. I'm over here. I'm feeling good in my body. And then I don't know why. I know what I should be eating. I know I should be able to do this, but I just can't keep it up. And then we go into old familiar habits over here. And then, oh my gosh, down here, I can't believe I did it again. Self-judgment. Self-judgment, right? Body dissatisfaction. How did I do it again? Oh, I'm, you know, I can get everything in my life right, but I just can't get this. If I could just get this together, the rest of my life would be great, right? So then we're busy over here in self-judgment, self-dissatisfaction, and then we go, oh, I know. Let me find a new plan. <laughs> that one just wasn't working. That, that one wasn't diet. the right plan, right? Let me find <laughs> yeah. a different diet. You know, keto didn't work. Let me try paleo. Paleo didn't work. Let me try raw. Raw didn't work. Let me try vegan. Vegan didn't work. Let me try, right? All, you know, all of it, right? Whatever it is. Let me, this, this celebrity is doing this diet. I'll try that one. All of those diets. Let me find a new one. And then up here, we're all, all gung-ho. And then over here, it's working. It's doing great. Uh, I don't know why it can't work. I don't know why I can't stick with it. What's wrong with me? And away we go. Again. Again. You know, and the, the body image dissatisfaction, that starts early because I remember being 13, I think is when I noticed it. 13, sitting in my seat in junior high school, looking at everyone, all the other girls' tummies and noticing they were flat and looking at mine and it was, I was a different shape and I was so unhappy and I would suck it in. Like right. I would be like, <gasps> like I, right. I wouldn't breathe because I, so I learned how, and now I know, okay, so you know, actually, you know, here's a funny story. So Nina actually knows one of my teachers <laughs> from the Four Winds who I actually went to Asangate with, uh, Julie Hannon. And I remember being on Asangate, and Asangate is 13,500 feet just at base camp. And I had to breathe to survive. Not just breathe from here, but breathe, belly breathe, like suck in air, let my belly expand, breathing in the air. And there's nothing to teach you that you're not breathing, like being up on Asangate with no air. <laughs> I mean, you learn how to breathe, but I realized I learned how not to breathe through the domestication. Yeah. Having a flat tummy. Right. We learn how to hold it together, to not breathe. And as we don't breathe also, we don't feel, right? Because what is, you know, energy is, is emotion. Emotion in, like, emotion is energy in motion right? That's our emotion. That's our feelings. It's energy in emotion. How does energy move or not move? With our breath, right? So, oh, I'm feeling uncomfortable in this situation. It's a social situation. It's new. I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Let me hold my breath. Suck it in. <laughs> and we do that. I mean, and watch yourself. I mean, just do an experiment where you pay attention to that for one week and you'll be shocked at how many times you hold your breath. Yeah. And the thing is for women, at least women who have struggles around food and body and who may see themselves as emotional eaters, right? I'm feeling something. And so I think I'll eat something. It's that holding tight, not letting that emotion that energy in motion move through that we go oh my gosh let me hold let me put the lid on that let me turn the volume down on those feelings i think that bagel that'll do it that'll stop the feelings right and then we go oh my gosh i can't believe i ate the bagel then we give ourselves a hard time because we use the bagel as a numbing agent 
right? So there's this really, it gets very tricky in there because we want to be allowing ourselves to feel, but feeling feels a little scary. So, uh-oh, I better turn the volume down on scary. Let me go to the food. But then, uh-oh, I have feelings about eating the food because I wasn't really hungry, didn't really want the bagel. I don't really feel that great now. So now I'm going to judge myself for eating the food. And now I have another feeling that I don't want to feel. That is so, you know, that I have totally been through this process in my life. I mean, I think the most successful when I was into weight management, (laughs) the most successful was Weight Watchers only because it got me thinking about food in a different way. Like I knew I was emotionally eating at that point. Like I identified it, like I'm emotionally eating. And it, some of the conversations that came out in the meetings really helped me because I was like, wow, okay, this isn't about food at all. Like this is about me not accepting myself or judging myself and making poor choices because I want to be comfortable. Like, and I think that eating that pizza is going to make me feel comfortable. Right. It's going to give me, or eating the ice cream is going to make me feel better. Because I witnessed my mom eating ice cream. That's how she coped with stress. She would, eat, she would binge eat ice cream and then put the containers in the trash so that me and dad didn't know she ate the ice cream. Right. <laughs> but we right. knew she was eating the ice cream because, you know, the rest of the time she's eating those, those, um, those rice cakes, which I think are sent for, for torture. Because <laughs> rice cakes, they're just, it's like not food. I mean, it's just something to put in your body. But it's so interesting what you're saying about that desire to, to, first of all, the shame around eating, right? The fact that she had to put it in the trash, right? We have so much shame around eating and going for what is in her situation and what you're talking about with yourself, a coping mechanism, right? So we judge, she's trying to cope with her feelings, right? There's a lot of feelings. There's a lot of feelings about depriving and living on rice cakes. And so, you know what? I can't live in that deprivation. I need to get out of that deprivation. I need pleasure. And I'm having a lot of feelings. So I'm going to eat the ice cream, right? So then we judge the ice cream and judge the food and judge ourselves about it. But really what that is, is there's some incredible wisdom in that food. And I know it's a little hot, a bit of a stretch for some people, because some people would say, oh, that's just bad food. But if we can zoom out from this bad food and look at it instead as an incredible um, piece of coping wisdom, it's the only way that in that moment, we know how to cope. We know how to survive the moment. We know how to deal with that feeling. And of course, are there other coping mechanisms? Yes. Do we need support finding them? Of course. But slamming ourselves and judging ourselves for going to the food when we're having a feeling and we're just trying to get through is not the way. So judging and being hard and what I hear from so many women, I just need more willpower, is not the path. So the path, instead of the judgment, instead of the good food, bad food, instead of the I did it wrong, instead of what's wrong with me, what's wrong with the food, if we can shift, and this sometimes takes support, if we can shift to a model of how can I really care for myself? How can I be in a place of more nourishment? How can I be in a place of more caring for myself? How can I be in a place of deeper listening? to my body, to my feelings, right? How can I be in this place of being in relationship? That's the key. Yeah, I love that. That is definitely one of the things I realized along this journey when I began my spiritual healing because I was doing what a lot of women do. I was trying to be perfect. You know, I was trying to like meet this standard, this image of perfection. And, um, you know, I had a husband who was very invested in that at the time, (laughs) you know, so of course it got like very intense and I was like running marathons near the end there. Cause I had put on weight several times. I'd gone through several cycles of like gaining to 205, 210 pounds and then losing 60, 70 pounds you know, getting back into a, a healthy weight and then gaining it again, 
you know, because what, why? Because I was not happy and I was trying to cope and stay in a marriage that didn't make me happy. And near the end there, I was running marathons. I was literally running for my life, you know? And I ran, I don't know, 13 or 14 half marathons, two full marathons. And meanwhile, I wasn't nourishing my body because this whole time, like, what's the food I'm eating? You know, some vegetables, but like pizza and like drinking gallons of wine, you know, because I can't cope with my life. And, you know, and, and then I've got a husband who's like, you know, um, babe, you know, after my first marathon, he's like, babe, you know, if you lost 10 more pounds, you could be the Playboy centerfold. <laughs> like, do I want to be the Playboy centerfold? Not yeah. really. Wow. You know, and so when I left that marriage, I walked out and I said, you know what? I'm going to eat as much chocolate cake as I want. So for like six months, I let myself eat anything because before that, there was like this constant monitoring of my eating. And like, he was like, you shouldn't have that second glass of wine or you shouldn't eat that cake or you shouldn't have this or you shouldn't do that because you want to be skinny. And it was so negative that I finally just said, you know what? I'm going to let myself have whatever I want. So for six months, I did that. And then after that, I said, you know what? This isn't healthy for my body. It's not good for me. I want to love my body, but I'm never going to go on another diet. I'm not doing that to myself again. So I'm going to love myself to health. You know, I'm going to honor myself to health. So everything you're talking about is like been my journey. Like I so resonate with this. Tell us a little bit more about your story. Like how did you come to this place where you're like the same pl place I came to? Like I've got to love myself through this. How did you get to that? Yeah, I absolutely want to. I just want to say something about what you just said, which is so powerful, is that sense of there was restriction, right? And some people, for you, it was your husband, that external restriction. For some people, they do it to themselves, right? It's the internal restriction. So some people, there's external, some people, there's internal, but for whatever it is, that can't be sustained, it cannot be sustained. So out of that comes a, let me out, let me be free. Which yes, is so, exactly. Right? It's like your months and months of chocolate cake, right? I was and, like, I'm out of here. I don't care. You know? Right. And a lot of people get scared of that stage. They get very scared, like, uh-oh, you know, what? I'm going to be out of control forever. But it's actually a really natural sh shift you know, from total restriction to freedom. So then once you get to freedom and you let yourself have it, then you get to this place of, well, wait, what do I actually like really want? How can I really care for myself? How can I really nourish myself? And that makes a huge, then we're into the land of true nourishment, right? We're not in a land of reaction, although that reaction is very important and that permission to eat because as women, there's no permission to eat. There's no permission to, you know, be in a place of desire and wanting. And it gets into a really interesting aspect around feminine aspects around um, body and food and masculine aspects around body and food. And I don't mean men and women. Um, that's a little different because we all have aspects of feminine, we all have aspects of masculine, but the masculine, I always think of the, the Nike ad, just do it. Yes, yeah, right? so I've had a big so, dose of that. Right, right, that was your marathon. Yeah, work, right? I'm, I'm just gonna, gonna run this marathon. Right, I'm just gonna do it, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna just keep on plugging along. Yeah. Right? I'm gonna tick off the boxes. I think of it also as sports, like stats. You know, how much do I weigh? How many grams? How many calories, right? It's very linear. It's very go, go, go directive versus the feminine aspect, which is more around flow. It's more around intuition. It's more around listening. It's more around connection. It's more around relationship. It's more around pleasure. And, and for me, it was like about a year after I made that choice, I actually bought my own house. That was a big move. Like I actually owned my own house for the first time, like me, myself owned it. And then I went on a trip. I went on a vacation, me, myself, and I, the three of us. <laughs> we went, <laughs> I love that. We, we went on a romantic vacation together <laughs> and I had to buy a swimsuit for this vacation because I went to Tulum, Mexico. 
and I had a bungalow and everything. It was right on the ocean and I had to buy a swimsuit. And I remember going to the swimsuit and I was taking out the swimsuit and I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I started judging myself. But by now I'd had some training, right? I'd had some work with my teacher, Heather Ashamar. I'd had a little training. So I, I was wise to this and I was like, okay, I'm going to reframe this. So I looked myself in the mirror and I just touched my curves and my poochy belly. And I said, you know what? I have indulged myself with chocolate cake and wine and pizza and all the things I wanted. And now I've earned sexy voluptuous curves. Kapow. <laughs> and I just posted that on Facebook. I was like, you know what? I'm okay. Yes. Some guy is going to love this poochie package. And in fact, I have a man now that loves my poochie package. And I'm happy in this body. Yeah. You know, so beautiful. tell us some about your story. Tell us like how you came to this moment where you're like, you know what, this, this doesn't work. This yeah. linear, like shaming, yeah. judging thing. <laughs> yeah. Shaming, judging thing. It doesn't work. It happens slowly. And I honestly, I wish that there was somebody like me, but what I do now when I was going through my journey, because it was all sort of me just trying to find my way. And my journey was my personal journey, but it became my professional journey, which is why I do what I do. Because I first needed to be like, okay, wait, I'm in a body. How do I even be in this body? Right. So I studied yoga. I became a yoga teacher. I became a body worker and I helped women get to a place where they could be safe and feel sensation in their body. That was my job, right? Because that's what I needed to know how to do. So I did that for years. And the more that I worked with women and their relationship with their body on my table, the more I realized that our body stories, we carry our story in our body. Our, our whole life is written in our body. And for women, it's quite a story because walking through our culture as a woman is really a challenge and always quite an experience in many different ways, including traumas, right? That's all in our body. And so being with women on their table and hearing and feeling their body stories, I was like, you know what? I think it's time for grad school. So I went back and became a therapist because I was really dealing deeply in people's psyche also. So I worked with people around their body, their feelings, their emotions, and I was still struggling with food and body. So I took, and I, and I was having, and I had little kids at the time. So I was like, you know what? I got to figure this out because I don't really want to continue this dynamic. So off I went to nutrition school. So then I really dived into nutrition. What's the right thing to eat and what's the wrong thing to eat? And thankfully it was a good nutrition school. So they were like, you know, there's a hundred right ways to eat. You know, someone's going to disagree with how you're eating somewhere. So you can let that one go. And then I started to combine those things, the food, the body, the nutrition, and really started to do this deeper work also around the psychology of who are we as eaters? And how do we trust our body? And so I started studying around body trust and more around embodiment. And so my work, became, who I became, became my work. And so the more that I developed that place of trusting, listening, really caring, really nourishing, giving myself permission to care for myself, giving my permission, myself permission, just like you did in that mirror moment, to say yes. I'm allowed to love all of this, you know, even the little thingies that hang out <laughs> in the, the sleeveless dresses, you know, I'd always put them on and be like, Oh, I don't know. You know, oh, that I know because that's, that's the way it's supposed to look. Right. Uh. I like, well, you know, here it is. This is my woman's body. This is my over 50 women's body. Here it is. You know, <laughs> like, okay, this is me. And, and as I've aged, this is me as I age. Which, and I tend to work with women over 40 because there's something that's happening there, which is suddenly we're not fitting into society's cultural youthism, right? And we have to start to be in relationship with a changing body, with a changing face, right? With changing skin, with changing digestion, right? I hear all the time women saying, you know, I don't know why I used to be able to eat this all the time. Our bodies are changing 
a hundred times in our lifetime. Right? So how do you work with that? So as I've really developed proficiency in that, my work has come along with me so that I am really helping women step into this place of deep nourishment. I love that. You know, I resonate with this so much because one of the things I realized was happening in my marriage was that I entered that relationship when I was 22. And I was in, a, you know, in 22, I was like, totally okay, you know, surrendering my power to my husband, you know, or like, you must know the answer. You must know the right way. You know, like, so I'm going to believe you or whatever. And you know? somehow he has more knowledge than like, you. Like somehow he, like two years older than me, has more knowledge than me, you know, which is ridiculous. It, doesn't that say something about how our culture is set up? Because that's how our, and I went to Smith College, you know, so I mean, if you guys know where Smith College is, it's a big women's college. Like, they teach you about this stuff. They tell you specifically, don't fall into this trap. Like, they warn you. They school you about this. Like, women stand in your power. And even with that, I still went for the guy that, like, had all the answers. And I just had to follow along. And it started to get uncomfortable because I had my kids. And now something woke up in me. Like something really deep and profound woke up in me when I had kids. And I was like, wait a second, he's telling me to parent this way, but I, f I feel that's not right. Like I feel there's something more. My body's telling me that that's not right. And my body's telling me I need to be here for my son in this way. I don't think what he's saying is right. And so I started like, we started having a lot of arguments, you know, in our marriage. Cause I was like, no, I'm not sure about this. Plus my body was unlocking things like I was unlocking my childhood trauma, like my, all this stuff was coming up for me that I hadn't had access to in my life. But then I had a baby and all my childhood stuff started coming up. And so I was faced with like all this overwhelming stuff. So it was a really challenging time for me. But what it started doing was awakening this aspect of me that was tired of being the cheerleader. I was tired of being like stuffing myself and tightening myself into this little narrow space so that I didn't take up too much room or I didn't like speak too loudly or I didn't, you know, take too much power for myself. Right. I think women can resonate with this and, for sure. and you know, I finally had to go. Yeah. Cause what you're talking about is you were tuning into your body's wisdom and respecting it and honoring it and finally lifting it up to the place where it deserves to be in a place front and center, which is I am really going to take your advice, dear body, because as women, and actually this thing, this I think applies to men as well, is we're trained to listen from the neck up. So right? true. So it should all be logical. It should all be information and facts. And the food world works in that way too. Calories and carbs and proteins and all of that. Versus here's this amazing thing, our body, that has so much intelligence and so much wisdom. And to start listening in. But for some people, that can be scary because they've learned to living from the neck up means I don't have to feel much. I don't have to go into any of those painful things. And that our journey into being in real relationship, being embodied, being in a body, often means starting to move through some of the unresolved body story. Some of the places where you didn't feel heard, where your power was squashed where you, you're, there was a knowing and someone said, no, no, you know, you're wrong about that. You're, you're crazy. I heard that one a lot growing up. So, you know, here's something interesting is, um, I don't, I'm, maybe you know the reference, but I've heard that science is now showing that the body actually stores, is the storage of the subconscious. Like the body actually, cellular cool. memory stores, that's what our subconscious actually is, is distributed computing across our body. So, you know, it's not surprising that we need to clean out that subconscious through the body. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And people, you know, I saw it years ago when I was doing body work. You know, you, you put your hands on somebody and a whole memory would unfold, right? And that happens also with our relationship with food all the time. You talk to people and they have a bite of like that lasagna and they're like, oh my gosh, I so, rem that flavor, that smell, that's my grandmother, 
right? So we start to engage with the cellular memory, that food memory, right? So those kind of connections to food and body, to memories, to how we feel, it's, it, it's very, um, it's like all connected, you know? And it's like, it's really like, it's not just um, this third dimensional experience, like uh, I'm going to eat this food or here's this pizza or here's this vegetable or whatever. It's, it's actually a spiritual journey through your body. It is. <laughs> this is a different kind of way of going through your spiritual experience. Well, and I often say to women who are struggling with their size, they're struggling with their food, they're struggling with their body, that for those of us who have those struggles, that it's sort of like we don't need to go to a personal work, personal growth workshop. All you have to do is like sit down at lunch <laughs> and it's all there. So fun. Right? Yeah. Because all our feelings come up about, you know, Am I allowed to eat that much? Am I really allowed to feel full? Should I be feeling hungry all the time? You know, am I allowed to have sweets and enjoyment and pleasure? As, am I supposed to only be eating diet food, right? There's all these different conversations that come to the table when we sit down to eat. And so if we can use that opportunity as an opportunity to grow spiritually, grow in our in terms of our identity of who we are grow in terms of our strength and our power right I, the amount of energy that women spend on food and body and hating themselves i'm like imagine if you could come to a place of peace and ease the amount of power you would reclaim yeah and you know Sexuality is all tied up in this too. Um, we probably won't go down that tunnel, but it's just a little note that is also something to explore on your journey. But what's really interesting is also the food itself is conscious. And I think that a lot of people don't maybe make that connection that, you know, food also is a consciousness. The vegetables, you know, the lasagna on your plate, the, you know, the roots that you ate, the root vegetables, all of it, everything you're putting in your body, it's all consciousness and you can actually infuse it. You know, it's like this, um, the experiment with uh, the water, you know, with the, mm -hmm. the drops of the water and how the words that you use to put into the water created either something beautiful or something malformed. We're 70% water and a lot of food is as well. And so we're, we can actually infuse things with love. And my husband's always, my, my husband now is aware of this. So he's always putting love in the food. And when you eat food that has love in it, it, it tastes so good. I mean, it just, it tastes different. Yeah. Well, it's like you're saying, you know, that the vibration, the energy, the intention is going to impact our cells for sure. Absolutely. Um, but just to go back to something you said, because I can't quite blip over it, is the ah, sexuality piece. I know. I was like, are we yeah, going to go down that? that. that. Okay. All right. We're going to go down there. So women, when I talk to women about their food, and with, about their bodies specifically, it ends up really impacting their sense of their sensuality and their sense of sexuality, right? I talk to many, many women who feel, I don't feel comfortable in my body, so I don't really get naked in the daylight or with the lights on, and I don't really let myself relax because I'm thinking, if he puts my, his hand on my belly, or if he puts his hand here, it'll, he'll feel my actual size and it won't be attractive to him, right? So there's a worry up here. There's a tightness in here. Now, if we're trying to relax and have true pleasure, it's hard to do it when we're feeling stressed in our mind and tight in our body right? In order to get to a place where we can be truly tuned into sensation, that means sensuality, we have to get to a place of feeling relaxed in our body, right? It's very hard when we're in fight or flight. That's our nervous system activation when we're in 
like stress, we go into fight or flight. That's our sympathetic nervous system activation. It's very hard when we're in that mode of protecting our body and, uh oh, am I going to be judged to feel pleasure? In fact, we're designed to not feel pleasure in that moment. Like you're running from the tiger. <laughs> yeah. Your body is not turned on for, gee, that's a nice smelling flower. I think I'll stop and admire it. Your focus is straight ahead and getting out of there. That's how the body is wired. So then to say, okay, I'm gonna be really tight and really charged up and revved in my sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, go, go, go mode, and then I'm supposed to have a great sex life? You're asking a lot. And then we go, well, what's wrong that I don't feel great in bed? Well, let's back it up a little bit and go, let's get you feeling great in your body, feeling at home in your skin. And there's this French saying that is my favorite that I always say, which is je me sens bien dans ma peau. It means I feel good in my skin. I love that. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it just says it to me, like it speaks to me that like, I feel good in my own skin. And when we can feel good in our own skin, when we can feel our own skin, then we have access to sensuality, right? Then we have access to how does this feel? What do I feel? What's my knowing right now? We have access to ourselves and the incredible wisdom that we hold as women. So then once we get that, there's a lot of power that opens up, including sexual power. You know, I want to, okay, so I'll dive down in the tunnel. So I want to say that uh, I've experienced all angles of this. So when I was with my first marriage, of course, I was very self-conscious with my body because I was very concerned about being judged. And I, of course, married somebody who was very judgmental, you know, so I got what I asked for. And as a result, I, I couldn't really relax to that point. So the sex was very, like, you know, aggressive. Like it was this masculine conquering sort of sex you know like it's going to get over really fast and now i know that that's not how women are you know as a matter of fact the female body it needs a lot of time a lot of trust a lot of relaxation a lot of opening a lot of love and nurturing in order to in order to sort of like unfold the flower you know so to speak and it's only really since um that i actually left that marriage and for a little while, I was actually, uh, you know, wrestling the orgasm out of myself with a vibrator, you know, <laughs> just like, I'm going to get it, wrestling it out, you know. But since I started this body love, like you're talking about this whole journey of like loving your body and like being okay with it, you know, how it is, the poochie curves and the whole thing. And I'm not going to fight with myself over food. I'm going to love it. I'm going to just notice what touch feels like. I'm going to you know, interact with my body consciously, like, can I send it love? Can I love myself in the mirror? You know, I've got some curves. Can I do that? That also was my sexual journey. You know, can I love myself for me? Like, can this be my experience, not for someone else, like not for the guy? Can it be my experience with my body, no matter if somebody's there with me or not? Yes. And as I really opened to myself there, because I went through a period of like external celibacy where I was just not with anybody, but I was just with me and, you know, experimenting and feeling and being with myself. What gives me pleasure? What do I like? At that point, I was able to open and trust myself enough that when I met my new, my husband, you know, when I met him a few years ago, now I've been able to experience like all the whole range of orgasm, but it's not because I mean, he is gifted, but it's because I've opened myself. It's because yeah. I'm willing to be open. I'm willing to trust. I'm willing to relax. Right. And I'm willing to receive. Yeah. You've, oh, you've developed the language of pleasure and sensuality within yourself, right? That's the piece of embodiment, coming to a relationship where you speak your body's language. The body likes to speak pleasure. It can speak pain too, for sure. That's a very clear way that our body talks to us, right? You've injured yourself. It says pain Ow. or something. Pay attention. Ow. Pain is important, but when we can start to move into that realm of pleasure and really have those conversations, then it's like the body starts to be a joyful place 
to live. And that's what we want. Women often go, well, this is just the way it is. You know, I'm just going to be at war and managing my body and working on the next. It's not so that we can really have that place of pleasure, of ease. And when we're in that place, our soul, our sense of spirit starts to like vibrate at a place that's just, we're more connected. We're more in tune. We know what, what, what we need, what our higher self can guide easier when we're not in that conversation. Yeah. And you know, I've noticed for me, like my eyes light up now, you know, like before it felt like my eyes were always sort of squinting. Like mm -hmm. I was, you know, like I could really, we could really see my eyes. And now it's more like I let, I let people in, you know, I'm willing to be seen. And that is a huge gift because when you're willing to open up and you're be seen, your soul is like pouring out through your eyes you you connect with people at such a deeper level and it's such a more fulfilling experience than yes. that tight controlled you know judging i'm not good enough space where i'm going to force myself to look like this image of perfection so i can be loved no i'm going to love what is yes and as i'm loving what is i'm coaxing my entire being into deeper and deeper levels of love where like nurturing myself is just now the next most practical thing. You know, it's like, of course I want to nurture myself. Right. And a lot of women will hear that and go, but, but there's so much to do. There's so many things, right? I have like a to-do list this long and my kids need this and my parents need that. And, and I want to say like, yes, all of that falls on us as women often. And we have to get to a place of saying, what about me? What do I need in this? And the what do I need when it's, and it's a tricky thing, especially in the sort of spiritual world where, you know, we're supposed to be a little bit selfless and really, you know, spirit conscious is to that actually saying, what do I need? What, what, about me and doing what seems a little bit selfish actually will strengthen that ability to serve, will strengthen that ability to be connected to spirit, that we have to care for ourselves first. And from that place, we can give more. Our well is full, right? The cup is full and then we can share. So Absolutely. Important. Yeah, I was, um, there's also these energetic um, dynamics between people uh, that I only learned about in the last few years, you know, through my training. But cords are real. You know, cords between people are real. And you can actually train your children to put those cords into the earth, especially if you have young ones. They understand it. Like if you talk to your kid and you say, are you, do you have a cord in mommy? You know, do you have a cord in me to get energy? Do you feel scared and you want to like wrap yourself around me. How about if this, how about if you be like a tree? Why don't we try that together? And you can actually, your kids know how to do it. It's amazing. Like the younger generations, they just get it. Just be like a tree, put your roots all the way down into the center of the earth. There's this beautiful ball of light there. You see it. They're like, yeah, I see it. Okay. Dip in there and suck like a straw, you know, <laughs> pull it back up. And now you and I can have a heart bridge. And a heart bridge is much better. See, feel that. And they, they, they feel it when it connects, actually. They feel it. And they know you're there, but you're not feeding them your energy. I think a lot of us women get in this place of feeding others our energy. Mm -hmm. And when we're doing that, we get depleted, and then we want to fill back up. And we're doing it with food. But what we really just need is better boundaries and teaching others around us how to be in right relationship with us. So that our cup stays full. Yeah. And that, that is around knowing what we deserve and raising that bar so that you train people to treat you the way that you deserve. Right? Yeah. And you've you got to first treat yourself. You <laughs> right. Treating yourself the way you deserve and training the people around you, which means asking for what you need, which for so many women is hard. And I know for me, for years was really hard. I was like, no, 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 I can do it myself. I got <laughs> it. Superwoman. Right. 
we got the superwoman thing, you know, and I still default to it. Sometimes I'm like, wait a second, why am I doing this all by myself? Right? Why am I the only one here? Right? And then asking for that support so that we can then feel nourished and not alone. Because I see, I hear it every day, women who are like, you know, pulling the hundred pound weight all by themselves and then feel like, oh my gosh, I did it. And now I should deserve, I should get a medal, which they should. I, there's no medal coming to me. So let me have that ice cream, right? That becomes the medal. And there's nothing, you know, I'm not denouncing ice cream. I'm just I think ice cream is great, but you know. It, it just may not be the medal that you actually really need or that truly nourishes you. And I think it's a level of awareness to say, wow, I'm really wanting ice cream right now. Do I really want that? And then to go inside and check. No, I just, I think what I really want is a hug, like a really long nourishing hug. Yeah. Like right now. (laughs) A, A wonderful client of mine told me a story and she said, you know, I was alone in the house and she said, I was like starting to feel a little snacky. And she was like, what do I really need? And she started just petting herself. And she was like, I need a hug. But she was on her own. So she took a blanket and she wrapped herself around. I love that. And really swaddled herself up. And she just sat there and she was like, yes, I just need to feel like I am, I'm held. I'm not alone. Even though she was alone in the house, I'm not alone. And she said, as she sat there and really soaked it in, all her cravings fell away. But it wasn't that the cravings were bad. The cravings were like a red alert, like something's going on here. I need something. So the question of, you know, what would, what would really nourish me? What really, really nourishes me is very, very important. What do I really need? What do I desire? What would give me deep pleasure? And when we do that, when we show up in that way with ourselves, we get a chance to experience a full cup. You know, and when we experience a full cup, we're able to show up in the world the way we really want to show up. Because how do we want to show up? I don't know. I want to show up loving. I want to show up compassionate and present with my kids and my husband. I want to show up with love in my heart and a listening ear. And I can't be present if I'm starving inside. Yeah. You know, I can't listen to someone else with full compassion if I'm like feeling hungry. Yeah. Or if I'm busy in self-dissatisfaction, right? If I'm criticizing myself all the time, I can't really take in the love because it's like saying, no, 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 love me, take care of me. But nope, because- Oh my gosh, so many years I did that. How many women do that? It's like, come here, come here. Right. No, no, no. No, 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 no. I don't really believe it because I'm not worthy of that. So many years I spent in that pattern profound wow so many great so much great stuff in this interview thank you so much for sharing your story and your wisdom so deep Mm. now i know people will want to go deeper with you so tell us how they can how can they go deeper with you and experience this nourishment well one really wonderful um resource i have that i want to share is an ebook that's free it's called how to be a woman at ease in your body And it really, you know, gets into a lot of what we talked about because that's what we want is that sense of ease in our body. So the best way to find that is to go to ninamanelson.com forward slash body ease ebook. And that's a way to really, you know, get a little more nugget or something that's a little more tangible to take away from this conversation. And that way you'll also get connected to me and I can send you more inspiration. And if you want to reach out straight to me, just come to my um, website, ninamanelson.com. And there's ways to either set up a get acquainted session or email me. Okay, so great. So reach out to Nina if you're interested in exploring this deeper and finding some more deep satisfaction and nourishment in your own self so that you can be that source of love for others in your life. This is a great opportunity. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And I always give everyone kisses on the way out. So if you want to join me, Mm. here we go. That's beautiful. 
I love you all. Thank you so much, Carrie. I really appreciate being here with you. Absolutely. Thank you for joining. And we'll see you all next week on Soul Nectar Show. In the meantime, give yourself some body love. Bye, everybody. <laughs>